So I'm Lonnie Shavelson. I'm the chair of this organization called the American Clinicians Academy on Medical Aid and Dying. Soon to, be, soon to become, because that's so hard to say, I think. Soon we will be the Academy of Aid and Dying. So the name is in the process of changing, not that. Um, and so I could tell you more about me and about the Academy, but I would much rather just sort of launch into what I want to do about the talk today. And hopefully by the time I'm done, in fact, I'm sure by the time I'm done, you will learn more about the Academy. So let's jump in because is this too close to me and I want to lower it down? It's getting a little bit static. I don't want to be yelling. All right, brief tech check. Oh, start the timer. Otherwise, you've been listening for two hours. Start this time. Okay. Um, I tend to be, uh, as you might have guessed, a little bit controversial, and I intend to be so tonight. Um, and I want to talk about. I want to talk about the uh, mythology around medical aid and dying. And the reason I wanted to talk to you all about this is because I like this. You're a pretty sophisticated crowd. And most of you know something about medical aid and dying. That's why you're here. And I'm, I'm sort of betting that you, like me, think of medical aid and dying in terms of a lot of mythology that's really been set down, what it really is. So let's just kind of jump into that. And when I was preparing this talk, I, I came across uh, an article in the New York Times by Carlos Rosada. He is the opinion columnist for the New York Times. And he wrote an article about mythology. And he said that myths are tales forever retold for their wisdom and their underlying truths. And so myths are great. Myths are, are built on this foundation of truth. You've got that underlying foundation. And, and then stories evolve and characters get added and metaphors come in and poetry comes in. And you build into this wonderful, informative entity that is a myth that everybody really, it's a useful thing. But as Lozada continues on, he said, watch out. Myths are also viewed as pernicious creatures that obscure more than they illuminate. So on top of that truth, foundation of truth, eventually you kind of lose track of, of the truthful part, and you get into a wonderful story that's got great power, but may not be truthful. The other problem with myths is that they are often the personal opinions of grumpy, gray-bearded men near oceans. And so given that problem, uh, if you will, I will go on. The, the very first myth I want to talk about is the myth that underlies everything. That we do. And it's the very definition of medical aid and dying. What is this thing that we're talking about? And for a long time, that was very, very vague. But in 1997, Arvin passes a law, and they have to write down something that says what it is. The lawyers did this. Some questions here. Well, let's see what the phone is coming. And they define medical aid and dying as something fairly simple. The writing of a prescription by a physician for a lethal medication given to terminally ill patients to end their lives. Prescription, physician, terminally ill, lethal, death. That's what it is, isn't it? It's just those type components. And, and what's happened is that all through all the new states that have come on and the new jurisdictions that have come on to 2021 have used that exact definition, changed the word here and there, but fundamentally we have prescription writing, terminally ill, lethal medication, die. That's what medical aid and dying is. And we can go all the way up to date. This is the journal, the clinical journal that most clinicians use, if not all, when they want to know what's what's new in the field, what is going on right now. And so you go online and you go to the journal and you look it up and up to date. And if you look it up to date a year ago and you put in the search and then medical aid and dying, what do you get? Well, you get the writing and prescription for a lethal medication to give them to a terminal ill patient to end their life's death. That's it. That's always been what it is. And so the folks at up to date realized 
that their article about Aidan Nye has been mostly about philosophy and law. And along the way, they contacted me and they said, you know what? We're a clinical journal. We only know about philosophy and law about medical aid and dying. Can you write a new section for up to date that actually talks about taking care of patients? The clinical definition. And I thought, well, all right, let me take a look at what you've got so far. And that's what I found. And what I found was the same old dirty definition of exactly what medical aid and dying is not. And so we rewrote it. And what you see in up to date now is the definition of medical aid and dying is the practice where a clinician cares for a terminally ill patient who considers, and pay attention to that word because that's going to come up a lot here, who considers and potentially falls through with hastening their imminent death through the use of medications prescribed for that purpose. What's changed here? Cares for a terminally ill patient. We don't just write prescriptions. What is that about? Writing a prescription, hand it to the patient, tell them to do what they want with it when they're ready? That's not medical care. And so we rewrote it and we advanced the focus from an act of just prescription writing to the much more complete and compassionate realm of aid and dying care. In fact, the term aid and dying and the word care had never been hooked together before that I could find until we put it out there. Aid and dying care, what an interesting concept. And so you may be thinking, I hope you are, is what the hell is this guy talking about? It really is the right prescription. You give it to the patient, they take the medication, they die. Isn't that really what it is? And what is this aid and dying care? Well, so in writing the up-to-date section, we came up with 18 separate chapter headings about what aid and dying care is. And so just as a game to see if I can do this fast enough, we talk about the likely aid and dying process. We talk about discussing all options, recommend hospice care, evaluating prognostic challenges, especially for neurological diseases. Talk about decision-making capacity and how to maintain it. We talk about family, religious, spiritual concerns, et cetera, et cetera. You get the idea on and on, following clinical changes, coordinating continuously with hospice, pre-aid and dying symptom management, which is essential in what we do looking at their opiate and benzodiazepine tolerance to change the pharmacology, looking at red flags that are at risk of prolonged deaths, clinicians attending at the bedside, followed by post-death family care, and everything in between. That's what aid and dying care is. Jose, can you turn me down a little bit? Thank you. How often do I offer somebody? Turn me down. And so here is where we have a problem. And the problem is as follows is that aid and dying patients, you clinicians in this room know, they contact us requesting aid and dying. That's the line, right? And so when they contact us and request aid and dying, they're working with the old definition. That's what they think we're gonna do. They're gonna contest us, I want aid and dying. Doc, I'm dying, give me a prescription. I'll put it in my bedside drawer. I'll hang on to it until I'm ready. I'll take the medications, I will die. They're working on the old definition, but I'm working on the new definition about providing aid and dying care. So we have a disconnect here, don't we? And the first part of my job in that disconnect is to change the language a little bit and to say, first thing, favorite two words in clinical medicine, let's chat. And the chat begins by saying, thank you. I'm, I'm understanding that you are requesting aid and dying, but I also know that you're early in the dying process and my guess is that you've only died once or are dying once. And so this is all new. And there's a pathway, a journal, a journey ahead of you. And the journey ahead of you may include indeed aid and dying, or maybe not. That's okay. The journey continues in surprising ways. Um, and so what's happening is that I'm trying to move the patients into a discussion about how are you dying? Remember the first thing in that up-to-date section is talk with the patient about how their death may go. Because you know what? When they thought about they wanted medical aid and dying, they might've done that for two years ago or 20 years ago, but they didn't get to dying yet. And so as they approach dying, we, are, we must have conversations with them about how their death is likely to go, give them more understanding, and we've changed that to 
I do this with all patients. I'm glad that you are considering aid in dying. Now let's talk about what it really is, because it's not about that prior definition of writing the prescription for a lethal medication. Here it is. Off you go. And so, but I'm betting that some of you are sitting there and saying, um, what are you doing? These people are dying, and they just want a prescription for medication to go on with their dying process. And you're giving them a hard time. Why do you do that? I mean, here you are, you're telling them it's more complicated than you think, and go read up to date, and doing all this silly stuff. Why are you giving your patients such a hard time? And the answer is through this. This is a 58-year-old female who two days ago heard that she had a positive mammogram and she has breast cancer in her left breast. And she says, thinks about it for a while. She knows it's quite significant from what she heard about the initial report. And she says, to her, she goes home that night and she talks to her wife and two adult children and says, here's what's going to happen. I have this breast cancer. I have a complicated, busy life. I want the quickest answer, the most thorough answer. Get this thing out of here. I'm done with it. And I want to have my left breast removed. And since that means that I'm also at risk of the right breast, let's take that one off. Too. That's what I'm going to do when I talk to my oncologist. I'm going to request a bilateral step. And so she does. She sees the oncologist two days later. And she says exactly what I just told you. And the oncologist says, well, if that's what you're requesting, then let's get you on the operating schedule for tomorrow. Of course not. What the, what the oncologist says is let's chat because there are many things to consider and to understand because it's more complicated than just let's take off your breasts. And we talk about chemotherapy, surgery, and all that. And what that means is we are providing the hallmark of good clinical medicine, which is called informed consent. And if somebody has their own idea of what it is, we will respect that and take that into consideration and talk about why that person wants the bilateral spectrum, which may not be the fastest route to what she wants to get back to her life again. It may not be the answer. But if all we do is respond to patients' requests, then we're not the patients, are we? We're not providing informed consent. So if we're offering something called considering aid and dying, and we move it there, and we present aid and dying as one of many options, then we're doing like that's what 89 care is is talking about options and accompanying these people on a very complicated journey for death which they don't know how it's going to end or what its middle is or what its beginning is and i don't know either but we're going to accompany them as we go there providing 89 care which may or may not terminate and take medications to them and so that brings up the myth of what's behind all of this stuff which is a myth that I've started calling misery versus mercy. If you look at the United States and about how they see dying, not death, but dying, they see it because they've had experience with relatives, read it in the media, and watched movies, and been on YouTube and all that. Dying is a process of misery and suffering. That's what everybody sees dying as. Not everybody. And we tend to exact this. Misery is what dying is about. And we, in the eight and nine community, of course, we're a mercy, eight and nine. As if there are those two choices, that's what it's about. And that's false, right? There's so much in between that can happen along the way, and it goes back and forth and up and down. So the misery versus mercy net is that really, I'm going to decide I want medical aid and dying when I die. I don't have terminal illness right now, but I know I want my medical aid to die. Well, that's just silly because I don't know how I'm dying yet. And so moving on to this misery versus mercy, here are some examples. HG was a patient of mine. She's 89 years old. She was 89 years old. She had a melanoma. It spread from her skin to her liver. And she calls me and she says, I watched my father die of cancer. And it was horrible. I will not die like that, so I am calling you. There's the word, requesting medication. That's what she thinks this is about. And so let's chat. And in the process of chatting with each other, 
it turns out that, yes, indeed, I heard her story. She watched her father die of cancer, and it was a horrible death. And now she has cancer, and she is scared out of her mind. But then when we go into the details, her father died more than 60 years before. And 60 years ago, well, you're sitting in a place that only had the first palliative care training program. Lynette, what did you say in 1999 or even later? 17? 15 years ago is when palliative care was first taught at this institution, right? 60 years ago when her father died, there was virtually no palliative care. Hospices were barely coming into existence. We didn't have long acting, short acting pain meds and patches and nerve blocks and all the good palliation that could happen. She watched her father die 60 years ago and she's been carrying that fear ever since. And she now wants medications to die. And it's really a good thing that we had to talk about that because all this stuff is now about. Medicine changes over time, but she was following the mythology of misery, that death is miserable and that's how it's gonna be for me, give me those medications. By the way, she did um, have a very comfortable progress in her dying pattern. She was hospice, she was really well taken care of, most of her symptoms went away, and she took med medications. So the disconnect here is the mythology that misery, the mythology is that mercy is the relief of misery rather than the continuation of mercy. 68 year old female with leukemia requests medications to die to avoid a painful death. And so we chat. And as it turns out, she had gone through a couple of years of treatment of her leukemia, and that was really, those were quality years, and she was very grateful for it, but those treatments were no longer working. And so she heard, now she says, leukemia, leukemia is a cancer. What kind of deaths happen in cancer? Miserable deaths happen in cancer. And I'm afraid, really afraid of having a cancer death. And nobody had had that first section we have in the up-to-date, which is, have the how you die conversation. Talk to the patient about how their unique one person death is likely to evolve. In leukemia, I said, do you know that leukemia rarely causes pain? And you're afraid of a painful death. And it's highly unlikely that you will have pain that is not treatable, not easily treatable. In fact, you're probably going to have almost no pain at all because the death of leukemia is through anemia and withering away and slowly fading out. Helped on by usually a couple of infections. And so I had said that to her, and she said, Well, Doc, you know, I'm just afraid of pain. What you're describing about this slow withering out, even if it takes a couple of weeks, that's fine. That sounds pretty good to me. So thanks for the advice. I don't need you, Doc. And and so, of course, my response would be, well, let's check some more. Because you're going down that pathway to dying where you have never been before. And it may be that you run into things and maybe wither in a way like that isn't what you want. And maybe it is. So what I want to do is I'll stay in touch. We'll talk about this as you progress. We'll see what you need. And I'm the one who holds that one treatment, which is aid and dying. I do that and some other people don't. So maybe you will end, wind up not wanting aid and dying. It may not be because you have pain. Or maybe you won't. And she had a very, very slow withering death. And she was fine. She never took medical aid and dying medications at all. And so I guess I failed, didn't I? Because I'm an aid and dying doctor. And she didn't take medications to die. Well, that's silly, right? I don't care takes medications to die or not. That's not part of what we're talking about. We're talking about that she got to have the death that she wanted accompanied by somebody who could offer various options. And we had her in hospice and we had her get good quality of care. And all sorts of family therapy was going on. All that was working well. And I didn't give a damn whether she took medications to die or not. But if she wanted them, I had them and knew how to do it and had to work with them. That's aid and dying care, not just prescription writing. So here's a fact. If you survey the population of the United States, which has been done many times, and you ask the question, what is your most significant fear about dying? 80% consistently in all those surveys say dying in pain. 
That's what I'm afraid of. I am afraid because I am him. If you ask that question, that's what you get. And so the corollary to that, of course, must be that pain is the most common reason patients take medication to die, right? If one is true, the second has to be They have to follow each other. But this one's a myth. And we know that because we have data. And we'll look at Oregon because they're the oldest, but every state has their own version of this, including California. And we look at the data, and this is from patients who take medications to die, that complete the process. And we're looking at what was the reason they did that. Look at that. Way down at the bottom is an inadequate pain. So that fact that dying and pain is the most significant fear is not really the reason that they take medications to die. There's that disconnect. And the reasons they take medications are decreased ability to enjoy life, loss of autonomy. And let me be clear, that is another form of suffering. It's a softer form of suffering, but not the one everybody's afraid of, right? But it's still there. And this is the reason that people take medications to die. One would think, but there's something wrong. Here. What's wrong here is that this is a checklist. And not only that, but it's filled out by the physician usually 30 to 60 days after the death about why, what the physician thinks was the cause of the patient, was the reason patients took medications to die. So the data is not all that hot in the first place, but let's play with it because it's all about the problem. What's missing is what we've all learned, some of the, myself in my practice, which was with hundreds of patients considering medical aid and diet, and probably most of the clinicians out here, is that the most common reason that patients take medications to die is not even on the list because in 1997, we knew nothing about medical aid and dying, and that's when they made that list. The most common reason that patients choose a date to take medications to die is fatigue and exhaustion, by far. When somebody calls me up and says, Doc, I'm in so much pain, bring on those medications to die, what do I do? Well, that's, that's a pain crisis. And we call in the palliative care team and we say, look, your patient's having a pain crisis. Let's see what we can do about that, because sometimes we can give them two, three, four months of really good, comfortable life. They were calling out for help because of pain. And of course, if they really, really want the medications, I will be there to do that. But the first thing I'm going to do is say, you're having a pain crisis. The answer to a pain crisis is not death medications. So thank you to all of our good palliative care docs. But when a patient says to me, Doc, I'm just so tired, I'm done. I really know. They are just that last two to three weeks of life. It's just not going to work for them. And that's the most common reason why I've got to take take medications to die. It's not on the list. It's not on any list. But, and here's the weird thing, right? If what I just showed you is all true, let's go to New York for a moment. Not to just pick on my New York colleagues, but I will. Um, where they don't have a medical diet. It's not legal in that state, and they want one. And so there's a big campaign going on to pass the law to do that. And what do they talk about? Misery versus mercy. Here's how they present medical aid and dying to need to pass the law. On the upper left, you see stop need the suffering pass through medical aid and dying. Upper right, you are guilt tripped by saying, this is a, these are all headlines from newspapers. Upper right, they say, if you delay in passing this law, you will be prolonging suffering. How's that for a On the middle, <laughs> the middle right, is a headline that says medical aid and dying is a Christian option to stop the suffering. And I looked at that and I thought, well, that's really interesting. And, and I pondered that for quite some time. And I just gave up on it. Didn't understand that I don't to this. So somebody out there, if you want to question and answer, please explain to me what that means. On the bottom right, a lot of the time, this is the literally what the words of an announcer on TV said in introducing a story about the need to pass this law. A lot of the time, people die alone, suffering and pain and worry. That is misery, isn't it? And it happens a lot of the time, and that's what New Yorkers are being asked to think. And then they add in, and this aid and dying law gives people a measure of peace, mercy. So... Is this misery versus mercy thing 
real? We're making it sound like it is. But it's not true about Dyer. The Buffalo News headlines a viewpoint article by saying, stop me the suffering of top, and they use as an example the daughter of a woman who died without medical aid and died. This is not legal in the States. And here's the quote from the daughter. Undoubtedly what she was thinking of experiencing. Horribly. Mom spent her last few months in hospice, leading to a slow suffering death. Well, really? Is that what hospice is about? Is that hospice is horrible and it leads to a slow suffering death? Is that what we're trying to teach people? Because to be very, very, very clear with you, in the misery versus mercy dichotomy, hospice is right up there in the mercy column. No question about it. That's just wrong. Whether it gets votes or not, it's just wrong. 96-year-old female patient of mine has congestive heart failure from a leaky mitral valve. She is offered by the cardiac surgeons that they will cut open her chest, get her microphone, um, slice open her heart, put in a new heart valve, sew her back up together again, send her off to rehab, and, and she gets better. And she says, no, you're not. And so she gets admitted to hospice at her request for terminal heart failure. And she says to the hospice, I want medical aid time. And they say, great, we support you in that, but we don't actively participate. They call me, it takes me a couple of days to get her medical records. And they say, come on, buddy, go see this woman. And I get there two days later. And she, before I could barely introduce myself, she hands me this nine page letter that she had written over the last 40 years. And this letter lists all the reasons that she deserves medical aid to die. Because, she says, I'm not in pain. In fact, I'm, not, I'm barely suffering. I'm just old and here, and I am going to die. And I'm, I don't have severe suffering. And that law was for pain and suffering, wasn't it? It was for cancer patients who you can't fix their pain. She knew the misery versus mercy myth, and she was afraid that she hadn't had enough mercy, uh, enough misery that I would provide mercy. And she had to convince me that she could have medical aid in dying. Well, no law in this country says you have to suffer to have medical aid in dying. It's a pathway you take. But yet, every day in the medical aid in dying clinical community, we hear about patients who think that they have to be severely suffering before they can ask for relief. The misery versus mercy dichotomy is out there and it's causing harm. And so, that's me. Um, when I get off on a ramp like this, I will, of necessity, knowing who I am, say, well, let me just go check this out. And I want to dive deep into the medical literature and get a sense of whether I'm off base or not. And so I dive into the medical literature. And these days, because I'm a modern guy, I go to ChatGPT. And, and what is ChatGPT? ChatGPT will, will survey the entire internet kind of amazing. And they take all the information that's out there and they kind of summarize it, put it all together and answer a question. And so I asked ChatGPT, why do patients do aid and dying? What are patients using for aid and dying? And it paused for a microsecond and came up with a beautiful essay. And surveying the entire information that's out there, here were the first two paragraphs. Many terminally ill individuals experience severe pain and other symptoms that cannot be effectively managed. That's the general sense of dying out there that Chachi summarized. Isn't that misery? But mercy, eight and nine cause them to end their suffering and die with dignity. So this misery versus mercy thing is not an illusion. It's the environment in which we work. And we have to be very, very careful about not playing into it all of the time. So are we representing eight and dying as the response to widely held but questionably accurate fear of painful and dignified deaths. Is that what we're promulgating? That we are the response to fear of pain? Or could fear of dying be the driving force toward aid in dying? Is that what we're doing? Is that what we offer? And so we can look at the left, left, and talk about aid in dying as the alleviation of what you see on the left, the alleviation of suffering, forlorn patients, pitiful and pathetic, in pain, leading tragic dying processes, 
hopeless and in everything. We can look at that and we can relieve that. That's what we do is we relieve that. Or we might change our language and viewpoint quite a bit and talk about the fact that what we are offering are options and privileges, rights, freedoms, opportunities, and autonomy. We don't just re resolve tragic suffering. We're offering you new options and new tactics. Isn't that a better way to do things? Because aid and dying, fundamentally, at its core, is about retaking control. Because when you are first told that you have a terminal illness, the first thing that you lose is control. Your body has just betrayed you. You're going to have meetings with clinicians all over the place. The medical establishment is going to take over on Monday. You're going to go to chemotherapy Tuesday. You're going to go to radiotherapy. If you have ALS, you're going to get swallowing studies and res respiratory studies. Whatever it is, the medical establishment is going to run your life for quite some time. And that is a wonderful thing. Because most commonly, they will provide you with extended quality of life. You know, by days or weeks or months or years or decades, that works. So that, but, but you lose control and then you get back a significant amount of life. But here's something unusual in medicine, right? This is 100%. 100% of the time, at some point in time, that fails. It works quite nicely. For a significant amount of time and then it fails for every one of us always and that's when they enter our realm of the less than six month prognosis to consider medical aid back. that's when they're with us and when they come to us we want to describe well if you're really suffering a lot and things are going badly enough well then we'll provide them nine do we want to do that or do we want to present what we do is i'm here to help you get control back for the first time in your life. I'm going to go through the second. And so now that I've talked about misery and why that is such a pervasive item and an exaggerated to the point of the misery of death is, is mythological now, let's now talk about why mercy is equally as mythological, and that's our side from aid and dying. And I call this one the white dove myth. The white dove myth means that you're going to come to me and you're going to request medical aid and diet, and I'm going to give you a prescription. You'll fill it at the pharmacy, and you're going to put it in your bedside drawer, and you're going to let it sit there, and you're going to go down along the pathway towards your death, and at some point in time, you want to take the medications. You take the medications. You gently fall asleep, enter a coma, stop breathing, your heart stops, and the white dove flies out the window to the sky. And I always like to guess what my audience is thinking. So you're probably thinking now, oh boy, he's really exaggerating this time. Do we present medical aid in dying as doves flying into the sky? Is that what we're doing? Well, here are a number of, and there are many more that I could show you, of aid in dying organizations. And their logos almost uniformly include birds flying into the sky. In Texas, Death with Dignity in Texas, they don't have an aid and dying law. They want one. There's an organization, Death with the, Death, Texas, Death with Dignity, gently and painlessly. It's Texas, so there's an eagle, and it spreads its wings, and aid and dying comes along, and it flies up into the sunset. Isn't that a wonderful thing that we're offering? Okay? That is our mythology that we're spreading. This one is one of my favorites. Conference I went to in 2019, Choosing Death Over Suffering, Informing Patients About Physician and Dying. And look at that visual metaphor. Isn't that amazing? Lower left, rusty chains of illness holding you back and causing pain and misery and suffering. A link breaks, that's a dying, and the bird flies off into that wonderful sunset. And so you're probably thinking, oh, there go the Texans again, but exaggerating. This conference was run by the Center for Bioethics at Harvard Medical School. So this image of death and mercy and our image of mercy pervades to the ethicists at Harvard Medical School. That's the way they presented it visually. And that's the way I think we sometimes mistakenly prevent what we're offering with aid and dying. 
the daughter of a patient of mine, spends amazing amounts of time with her father planning his perfect death. He flew in cousins and brothers and sisters from all over the country and put them up in hotels and paid for it. And she had them come to the house to visit. And she had wonderful catered meals in the house that the baby stopped by more often. And and she planned that death, and on the day of his death, I was there, as I have been for all of my patients, and I was there on the day of his death, and he had quite a lovely He died peacefully as he could. And she and I sat down on the stoop in her backyard, in her backyard, and she said to me, you know, I got so focused on my dad's perfect death that I missed the point that he would be dead. And I am devastated. The bird did not necessarily fly into the sky, did it? And we sometimes forget that we're not providing perfect deaths because I dare you to use the word death and perfect in the same sentence and do it right. Deaths are deaths because I've been now at hundreds of these eight and dying deaths, and yes, they can be the peaceful death that the patient died. But when I walk into that house in the morning, I know that by the time I leave in that afternoon, somebody who has been dearly loved, who, 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 who will be deeply missed, has died. That's not perfect. We're not flying birds into the sky. We shouldn't be working with the illusion, I think, that we are creating perfect deaths. They can get to be what the patient wants. That's it. For some patients, that's what they want. We offer that. But we have to be careful about, I'll be blunt here, overselling our product. We're not having birds fly to the sky, and yet that's our mythology. Because medical aid and dying is not a scheduled destination. It's an expert. When patients are considering aid in dying, we are acknowledging that dying is a dynamic and ever-changing process. You don't know which of these paths you're actually going down. You go down them. And you might go down the chemotherapy radiation path and then come right back down again and say, oh no, that's not for me. Let's try the hospice path. And that's working out, but it's not quite working out well enough, or maybe it is, and that's the way you'll die. Or you might go down the left, and that may be the medical aid in dying path, and our job as 89 clinicians is to be with them wherever they are on those paths, period. That's what we do is we take care of patients who are considering aid and dying. Because we as aid and dying clinicians are at our best when we're actually end of life clinicians. That's what we do. We as aid and dying clinicians are at our best when we are helping patients to make positive decisions about their deaths, not just fearful ones. We as a dying clinicians are at our best if we are helping our patients find their death with dignity, not ours. And so getting personal to all, um, as, as Lynette said, I started out in emergency medicine 29 years. And then I worked in the clinic for refugees and immigrants. And I did that for another seven years. And that was important work. It really was. And then in 2016, surprisingly, Jerry Brown signs the egg dying law. And I had been involved in the issue for a long time. And I thought, okay, I'll become an egg dying clinician and see what this is all about. And for five years, the only medical practice I had was to see only patients who were considering that. Period. That's what I did. Big learning curve. And something was odd. What appealed me was that there was something about medical aid and dying that touched my heart in a way that no other patient care before had done. And I did a lot of patient care. Something about that. And I had to puzzle that out. And I thought, what is that? What's going on here? And I talked to my colleagues, said, is this crazy? Is this just me? Or is this happening to you too? And most of them had stories about, oh, yeah, you know what? That's weird. That's happened to me, too. I've been in the nephrologist's 
pounding, wooden dying, that seems more important than all the kids. And so when I puzzled it through for me, I realized that that I had indeed been to all of his deaths, by now hundreds at the bedside on the day of the death. And what I watched was people from all walks of life, really amazing, everything from brothers and sisters to ex-wives and ex-lovers and ex-husbands, you name it, they're all in the room together because the miracle of what we do is that people can pick the time and date and place of their death so people can gather around while you are still cold. That's an amazing thing. And what I saw going on in those rooms was all these really complicated interactions of people who had known this person for sometimes 80 or 90 years. And they all got together and they knew that person was going to die that day. No question. And what, what I felt in that room, in that circumstance, was something I could only call pure love. That's what that room felt like. And for me, that was what was touching me, was watching all these people come together at that day of death, and no matter what their complicated relationships had been with that person, there was love in that. And for me, that helped me better understand life, that that's the trajectory of life, and that's the way that I understand it. And so I did talk to my colleagues, and here's what some of them said. The most empowering care I've ever provided. That's what they're saying. Oops. Oh, boy. And here's the final myth. The final myth is that for all of us, every one of us, 89 clinicians, what part of the field we're working in, at some point in time, a significant number of our patients say, I'm done. Bring me those myths. happens regularly. And then our relationship changes, doesn't it? Because we now have a specific request for a safe and comfortable procedure, a medical procedure, which is the patient is telling us, I'm ready to die at two o'clock. And our job at that point in time is to make that. And the myth is that pharmacologically, it is very easy to stop their heart and to do it comfortably. Why does that myth exist? Because, or why do I call it a myth? We know that overdoses happen all the time and people die. We read about it in newspapers, we see it, we hear about it, it's in movies. People take medications and they die. It's not that complicated, is it? And if you look at the typical sort of bedside table, of people in hospice, what are you seeing? You're seeing a whole bottle of morphine, some fentanyl, really good for pain control, should be there. You're seeing these days some ketamine, methadone for long acting pain relief, oxycodone for breakthrough pain. Why can't we just put these medications together, put them in a handful, say, here, dad, swallow this, and you'll die? The answer is, is because what we don't hear about are all the overdoses that don't die. It's not reliable. It's not as simple as saying, well, let's just take a bunch of toxic stuff, throw it together, and, and off you go. Bird flies into the sky. It's not that easy. And the fact then is, if you look at the evolution of 89 pharmacology from the beginning, there have been now eight different permutations of 89 medications. Why? Because it is pretty complicated stuff to make this happen well and reliably. 
And to understand the evolution of aid-and-dying pharmacology, I'm going to take you on a small trip. You have to understand hearts. The first beating contractile hearts, little muscular tubes that pumped blood along. The fossil re record shows that happened about 520 million years ago. Hearts have been beating for 520 million years. Aid-and-dying pharmacology had its first major advances, advances about seven years ago. So who has the head start on whom? Okay. The hearts are really, really good at beating on almost no matter what we do. That's what they are trained to do. 520 million years of evolution. And then the patient says, I want to die on Thursday at 3 o'clock. So there's a problem, isn't there? And it's not as simple as everybody says. And then the second way reason this is difficult is that the way the legislatures have written the laws in every place in the United States is that you cannot use injections. You cannot put medications into a port, subcutaneously, intramuscularly, IV, none of it, all forbidden by law. And so what we're left with, and what they say is our tool to make the heart stop, is what you see on the left there, the gastrointestinal tract. Why is that a problem? We all, everybody here takes pills and feel the effect and it makes them feel better or worse or whatever it may be, but pills work, right? Well, the, the problem with this in using the gastrointestinal tract is that somebody somewhere made this decision that people who are at the end of life, very sick and dying, and their bodies are turning down, really, really ill, but of course they have healthy guts. Well, that's just silly. The gastrointestinal tract in the dying person's body is also dying and also very sick. And so when you see a picture like this, this is just cancer, but it applies to ALS and it applies to so many other illnesses, is that the patient's body is turning off and wearing down and shutting down. And so their gastrointestinal tract is just as sick as they are. And whoever thought that that wasn't true was crazy. But that's the tool they've given us. And since we're in a medical school, we'll just make this even more scientific. On the left there, you're seeing the intestinal tract with normal villi, those wonderful little projections, finger-like projections that create a huge surface area, originally intended, of course, to absorb food and nutrients, but we've taken advantage of that and had to absorb pharmacology as well. But those, when you get to the patient who is really sick and wasted away, that's what their intestinal tract looks like on the right. All the villi are gone. And I'll tell you as well, gastric emptying is down, peristalsis is decreased. Everything that can go wrong in the gastric tract goes wrong, as you have said. And yet we have to put our medications into that and stop the patient's heart pumping. Not a small problem. And we have two major and I will present that these are two separate goals, entirely separate, although they seem related. We must get the patient to sleep. Goal number one. Goal number two, we must stop the patient's heart. And one thing I will tell you for sure is never reverse those at a time. Right? That's a pharmacological challenge and a trick, but we always want to know that before we stop their heart, they have to be deeply comatose and unconscious. So the pharmacology gets even more complicated. Now we've got a complicated gut. We've got a five and a 50 million year heart, right? And now we have to get the patient to sleep and stop their heart. So initially, the pharmacology of medical aid and dying started its problem in Oregon in 1997. And they thought just what we were talking about before, we'll just give them a lot of something. And the something that they used was secobarbital alone. And they gave them 10,000 milligrams of it. And that was the thought. We're going to get the patient to sleep. We're going to have the sleep progress the coma as the blood levels of secobarbital rise. The coma will progress down the brainstem. The brainstem, which normally supports respiration, drives respiration. The brainstem goes to sleep, breathing stops, and the lack of oxygen causes their heart to stop. That's the physiology of secobarbital. It doesn't have any effect that stops the heart, does it? It has to work through lack of oxygen. That's its mechanism. And so let's look at the data. Oregon 1990, 1998 to 2016, the median, right down the middle of all the long list of deaths, the median time for death is 25 minutes. Sounds great. 
the range of deaths with central barbital alone is reported to go out to about five days. Or three days or two days. There were deaths all along those in that range, and the median didn't change because that's the middle. The average, though, was quite different. For those of you who are statisticians, you just know exactly what I said. For those who aren't, yeah, get it. Um, so is this what the patients were asking us for? Were they asking to be put into a coma for four days and to lie there for four days while their families take care of them and wash their body and clean up their urine and wipe their butts and all that? Is that what they wanted with medical aid and dying? No, it is not. So we weren't doing our job. Sedatives alone, indeed, Really, 100%. I can't convince you of this more deeply. Sedatives put you into the sleep and coma. They really do the job alone. They solve the sleep problem. They do not solve the stop the heart because they don't reliably stop breathing. And you must stop breathing in order to stop the heart if you just use a sedative. So here we have another dilemma. And the dilemma is well, let's get everybody to sleep with sedatives, and then include in that cocktail they drank things that actually do stop the heart. Great idea started with Carol Perry up in Washington, and she and I sort of joined forces, studied it a bit. And so we knew that sedatives bring on sleep and mostly stop the heart. I mean, mostly is a terrible word. So we know that you get on sleep guaranteed. They mostly stop reading, and they mostly work. Not quite a good enough. So we start looking at cardiotoxins to specifically stop the heart. The first one was called DDMP2, the sedatives we use. Secondol had by this time gone off the market. I don't know the whole story of Secondol. But the sedatives we chose were morphine, enormous doses, and, di and diazepam, it's Valium. That's the sleep part. Okay. And why do I say enormous doses? Because remember, we have a sick gut. If we don't pour a ton of medicines into that gut, well, we're not going to get to where we want because the gut's not highly absorbed. So that's our compensation for the sick gut that we deal with. The original DDMP2 had the cardiotoxins called digitalis and propranolol. Propranolol is a beta blocker that slows the heart down. Digitalis blocks the heart rate in another location. And we thought, well, this is logical. We're going to slow the heart down, slow it down more, and slow it down more until it stops. That made sense. Also a bad word of medicine. And so we wanted to introduce some science. And the first science that was done um, started here in California. And we started using some electrocardiographic small handheld monitors at the bedside, along with pulse oximeters, and saying, let's try and understand these medicines. We can't just throw stuff at people. And so the understanding of the medications was the beginning of saying, well, with digitalis and propranolol, it slows the heart. That could work. And indeed, it did exactly what we wanted it to. Here's a patient of mine. Whoops. Jumping the gun. Oh, why is it doing that? Huh. Here we go. Here's a patient of mine with a heart rate of five. It was doing just what we wanted it to do, but the patient's in a coma. Their brain is shut off. Well, that's 25% of oxygen demand. Their body is a thing. There's no oxygen demand. They're happy as a clam with a heart rate of five. And so we would watch people with these very slow heart rates live on for hours and hours and hours. 18 hours, 20 hours. It wasn't working all the time. And so we scratch our heads and say, well, that was a good idea, wasn't it? And we switch. And we take out the propranolol and say, let's try the exact opposite approach. We're going to speed up the heart. Remember, the patient is comatose throughout this. We're going to have the medications hit. We're going to speed up the heart until it totally destabilizes the electrical conduction system and exhaust itself, and then die. Instead of slow, we're going to go to fast. And here's a patient of mine with the amitriptyline. Propranolol is out. Amitriptyline is the medication that speeds up the heart. There you will see this very, very, very fast heart rate. And then lo and behold, there they are. So we're now looking in for the first time, and that's why I say we only have seven years of this if we ignore the first many years of second law, for the first time we have science backing this up. That's, as I promised you, that's one of the things that we have to ask, is we bring the science of AD dying into medical care and science and evidence-based care 
if you look at the data, and, and we do, we collect lots of data, every vertical line you're looking at there is a patient who took his medications to die. The height of the line is how long did it take them to die after they took the medications. And look at that from DDMT2, how much that is. So we're collecting data to verify what we're doing. We're bringing science and best practices to the bedside. And I'll just end because this is, um, I could talk about this and I need to for about an hour at 85 pharmacology. You only get, according to my schedule, six minutes. What we're using now for those who want to know sedatives, get the patient to sleep. Morphine, 15,000 milligrams, diazepam, 1,000 milligrams, phenobarbital, 5,000 milligrams. To give you in a sense of what that means, the usual dose of morphine is around 20 milligrams. We're giving them 15,000 milligrams. We think that that would kill an army, but an army has healthy intestinal tracts. Our patients don't. So you need all those medicines to get around that problem of the disease organ that we're given as a tool by the law. Cardiotoxic medications, digitalis is still in there. 100 milligrams, the usual dose is 0.25, amitriptyline 8,000 milligrams, and there you have DDM. And here from 2018 to 2023 is a summary of the progress we've seen. We're bringing down, not eliminating, don't ever get into the illusion that we've eliminated long deaths. There are still occasional outliers, not at five days. There are long deaths. We all know that. We watch them. We learn from them. We modify the pharmacology. I don't have my slide about talking about the future in the pharmacology. Yet, this is the time. Um, but we are working on this constant gathering data. We have data on DDMAPH now on 3,500 patients. So we're really getting into the need to get scientific information about what this is all about, how it works, with the hopes that we will eventually tell you no more of it. Very close. This is how you find the Academy. Um, renamed, as I said, it's now the uh, Academy of Medicine. And we'll have our new site and all sorts of things up in about three months. Um, Go poke around on our website. There's so much information there about everything I've said plus more. We have um, a new journal. First edition came out in December called the Journal of Aid and Science. And some of the authors are right here. We have a book lit. It's about 80 pages, almost a book, for patients and their supporters considering medical aid. That kind of talks about a lot of what I'm talking about. This is not about prescription writing. Remember that. I still hear people saying, oh, I went to my doctor and got the prescription. That's not it. You provide aid and dying care. That's all there. Um, Faye, thank you. Um, this is, I am, I'm totally honored to be at the first medical school that is having an endowed talk on medical aid and dying. That's amazing. To make it more significant, there's another one coming up in New Mexico. So you led the way, and we got to New Mexico this following. Thank you all. Let's take some questions. I've already. Break the ice. I'm sorry. Thanks. No, I'm curious. Do you really not know why the headline that said that medical aid and dying is a prescription option? For oh, I have some ideas, but it still puzzles me. You know, it depends on what you say is Christian, where you put that. But yes, because there's a Christian right that is completely opposed to medical aid and dying. So we fall to see that headline. And there's other Christians and uh, in every other religion that, that totally understand that. Um, but my puzzle was the use of the headline itself. Why? Why is that puzzle? Um, I'm curious. 
You know, I, I think that that we have an interesting dilemma with the Christian right in the same sense as you know, abortion is the same. And, and it's sort of like saying that um, if I saw a headline that said, abortion is the Christian option um, in response to pregnancy, I would puzzle it out. And, and then there would be reasons for it, for that. Okay? But I think my puzzlement has to do with um, the role of the religious right has not been exactly in the camp of the rights of the society. And so when I look at that, I was thinking more of organized Christianity than individuals. I don't have a point. But that's usually not a political question. So that's my top answer. I grew up in D.C., so it makes perfect sense to me. There's a, there's a message that sure. needs to be gotten across and how people want people who identify as Christians to believe that this is an option. Sure. I'll buy it. Thank you. I love to be educated. Thank you. I don't have a question, but I would like to make a comment. Sure. I just want to thank you. I'm incredibly grateful to you for dedication that you've shown and the the, the just the fortitude that you've shown in helping to bring the art of, of aid and dying here so far forward and you've been a um a gift to many people who have needed guidance and and um you've been a, a light in in a space where there's a lot of darkness so i want to thank you thank you thank you that wasn't the plan Thank you for the talk. Can we get a tiny teaser on the future of the pharmacology? Sure. Um, I wish I had that slide. I could put it in there in case somebody has to ask a question. The the future of aid and dying pharmacology lies in a few realms. Paralytics, right? If we can get paralytics to work through the gastrointestinal tract, we'd hit 100. percent You just, but, but there's a there's a few problems pharmacologically, right? They have to be asleep. We don't want to paralyze anybody's breathing all this stuff. So we have to be really, 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 really sure that sleep provide sleep precedes death. Problem number one. Um, problem number two: the paralytics that are most commonly used these days, like Botox and all that, would run about eight thousand dollars to get an adequate dose into the gut. So it's too expensive. Problem number three is getting it across the gastric mucosa without it being broken down by acid and other things. That's actually solids resolvable. I was going to say soluble, but I don't mean the chemical there. Um, you know, when we looked into this, everybody has always taught us that the paralytic agents cannot be used orally. And, and why do we think that? Because anesthesiologists have always said, you know, what anesthesiologist is going to say is going to say, we're going to take out your gallbladder to swallow these pills. They, of course, use IV medication. So there's not a whole lot of pharmacologic study of a medicine that's always given IV. And if you look at it, only about two to three percent gets in. So all we have to do is give enormous dosages. Now the question is, what's the medicine? What are the dosages? How do they work? How do we get through the IRBs? Because we're changing the so There's a ton of work to be done, but paralytics, I think, are there. Second, um, metabolic agents. We're, we're doing a small sidearm study right now with lipizide, a diabetic drug that drops the blood sugar catastrophically about an hour or two after you take it, so we know we can get sleep through. I'm not sure what, what else to say. We have data now. It's not enough data that I'm going to conclude. So I'm going to leave that blank, but we'll, we're looking at glipizide as a coverage to work on metabolic pathways instead of just respiratory and cardiac pathways. Um, there's, there's things fantasy land out there about the stuff that get into now, but, but we're really looking. What, what I think we need to do, here's, here's where I'm at philosophically about this. I don't think we can make another advance in the pharmacology as we know it now. And yeah, we can tweak this and tweak that, but the moral of the story is you've got to really, when I, when I look at, let me qualify this, when we look at our failures, our very long deaths, and I do that because when I get data and somebody says, I just had a 24-hour death, the first thing I do is call up the clinician and say, let's go over what happened. And close to 100% of the time, the gut was very dismissed, very severely dismissed, and a very protected patient or somebody who hadn't eaten for months 
with just so many conditions. Or the second category are errors. Catheter got put in the rectum because the rectal meds, it blew the balloon and the meds went down. Those are the two causes, right? Very, very rarely do I have a death that goes out past about 20 hours that I can't sit down with the clinician and say, ah, I see what happened. And we learn from that. We change our red flag checklist that we have on the academy, and we grow from those cases. But I don't think, I mean, if somebody says to me, when this patient who hadn't eaten for three months and clearly had a intestinal tract that was not going to function, if they had called our advice line, we have a clinician's office, and said, here's the situation, what do I do? I would have said, either see if they're going to be able to be fed for a couple of weeks and get that gut to wake up a little bit, or don't do it. And then there's this big debate about whether the rectum will function for absorption. And I think the answer is, eh, probably not. Because the rectum gets its nutrition from stool coming down. It actually doesn't get most of its nutrition from blood supply. It's stool coming down. Not much stool has come down. There hasn't been any nutrition. The rectum is probably what I've started calling global gut dysfunction. Everything is just. The moral of the story is that we can tweak DDM and pH all we want, but the long cases are not a problem with DDM and pH. Or as I like to say, it's the patient's fault. It was the the medication, you can put the medications into that patient, and it doesn't matter what you're going to put into that severely diseased mal malfunctioning gut. It doesn't really matter what you put in. It's not going to work. With the exception, I think, of paralytics. They, if we can get enough on board and have the right timing of the release, I think we can get around that gut problem. Because one of the things we know with the gut problem is that invariably, especially because we had the phenobarbital, which is the only one of the drugs that's absorbed across the stomach, so you don't have to get it out into the community. Phenobarbital, we're, we're having really, really good success about always getting the patient to sleep. That means that I can still look at paralytics, even in diseased guts, and if we can get those paralytics through that barrier. And, and there are some interesting tricks. I'll tell you one. Um, there's a little gadget that's got a needle on it. It's a big pill with a needle that's hidden, and it's meant for diabetics to have insulin. That's what it's designed for, right? You swallow it as a pill. That's the ingestion part of the law. You swallow the pill. It writes itself like a turtle. It's based on how turtles write themselves. It's a triangle. The needle sticks into the stomach and injects the medication. So we are now having an ingestion that is legal and using an injection. And isn't that cool? If we can work with the company to make that happen and make it work. There's, there's many steps here, but I, I promise you, if I'm still around to do a lecture like this in five years, I'm going to be reporting to you how it works. So, well, it's, it's a reasonably big pill. And it may not hold as much paralytic. It may be too small even to hold the amount of paralytic that we need. Nonetheless, these are the new ideas that I, I think some of the younger age dying clinicians work on and figure this out. I don't think it's a it's a unsolvable problem. I think it's very complicated. And that's that's the myth, right? Is that just give them something. It's the myth and it's wrong. Thank you. Absolutely correct. Absolutely. We actually have both. Right? We we have both. And you know, so what, what Faye said, if you didn't hear it, is that the problem is a legal one. Every country in the world allows intravenous medications. And in, in Canada, for example, we won't go into the whole Canadian question. But in Canada, something like 97% of patients who are given the option of oral medications versus IV, choose IV. That's their choice, correct? All of the European countries do this. Australia, no. New Zealand, no. So it's not every country. Um, but, but here is where I stand with that. 
here's another problem. I love having you around because you're an advocate, a politician, and you do lobbying, and a lobbying and all that. I'm a clinician, and I don't touch legal lobbying questions and stand in the lane that we have. And I will tell you that if you pass a law that includes intravenous medications, I'll be right there making it work. That's what I want. Um, but I'm not going to be the one that makes that happen. I'm kind of busy. And I think that really, really, this is very sincere. The reason the Academy has succeeded in four years in becoming what it is, it's a national organization. Thank you for the introduction on that next up back there. You know, of saying that we have become the national organization about good clinical medicine on the right side. It's because we've stayed out of the political realm. We have stuck to who we are as clinicians. We've worked on the problem. We were given the gut, ah, terrible idea. We're going to make it work. We're going to make it work as best as we can. And we're not going to be lobbying and doing all that other stuff because we lose track of the And so your point is really well taken. Um, I love the idea that there are really good advocates, lobbyists, and people who know that system um, out there trying to make it happen. And if you make it happen, we will make it work. Well, it's a complicated physiologic problem, and there is a legal way around it, and there's a physiologic way. Yeah, it is a complicated physiologic problem. That's the fun of this. It ain't as easy as you think. Sure. Hi, I'm Margaret. I'm a social worker here at UCSD Health, and uh, I appreciate what you've described a good clinician could do to help somebody consider medical aid in dying and go through the process. And, and I wonder, within the limitations of reimbursement of many doctors who work for entities that don't provide home visits as part of their job and who have to bill units, right, in order to do their work and have appointments, um, how you feel about non-physician clinicians performing some of those roles, like having the 18-point conversation mm -hmm. and being in the home of day of dying, um, even if we don't work closely with the physician who may have prescribed. Mm -hmm. That is a phenomenally wonderful question. The answer is in the piece of information about the fact that 95.4% of our patients are in hospices. And any clinician, you may be a clinician, we'll, we'll start at the top or bottom, depending on your preference, the physicians. We'll not give them a grade, but just start with the physicians. They're busy in their clinic. They never make house calls. They're required by law to be the prescribing attending physicians. They have telephones, and there are hospice nurses who are following their patients throughout the course and, and here's an example. You prescribe the medications in January, and it says take by mouth. And in March, the patient with ovarian cancer develops a bowel obstruction, which is common about 30% of patients with cancer, and they can't take the medications by mouth. Well, how do you find that out if you're the clinician? Your job is to follow, not to give a medication one month and it's going to be used in three months and contraindicated. Well, you let the hospice nurse where they are know that you're the prescribing physician and you're a responsible person. Call me if anything happens to their, their gut tract or if they lose capacity or they're about to lose capacity or if they're using huge amounts of opiates and we have to add morphine or barbitol. All those things, it is in the realm of everybody in this institution and all its ingredients to make phone calls to the hospices where their patients are. They don't have to go to the homes. Second point, really well done. Social workers and nurses can go through that entire list of what I said. Notice that I use the term clinician. I don't say it's the physicians, it's the aid and dying physician's job. It is all of us as a team of aid and dying clinicians that work together. We have different roles and we have simultaneous roles. And if we don't establish communications, then whoever the attending prescribing physician is here in this institution who doesn't make any calls and know their patients are in hospice and all that is not doing a good aid and dying job. I'll say that quite clearly. But that doesn't mean they have to go out to the bedside every day or go to the patient's home. 
or leave their clinical rounds. They just have to know my patient with ovarian cancer is in hospice. I just gave them a huge dose of lethal medications that are with instructions to take it orally. And I know there's a 30% chance that they won't be able to swallow by the time. I'm a responsible clinician. They went to X hospice. Ex hospice has hospice nurses. I can find out who the hospice nurse is and say, please stay in touch. Call me every couple of weeks, let me know what's going on. Or call me if anything changes. We are a team of clinicians. That's why I use that term. And I think you're absolutely right. Social workers, doulas, doulas can attend the death. We train them to be together. So we have doula training programs so that we are sure that somebody can be there on the age of dying day. Why? Everybody talks about, oh, but they want to be private. People want to be alone. I just haven't found that true. What they want is they want to be loving family members and not distracted by how do you mix lethal medications and feel guilty about handing them to mom. What they want to do is be loving family. And so we train doulas to be at the bedside, do the mixing of the medications and help them through it. Or the hospice nurses will train them or the hospice social workers. Frequently hospice, I love it. Hospice nurses and social workers both go together in many hospices. So there are all sorts of things about this. What's not the right answer is when I hear somebody say, it's too hard, it's inconvenient. If, if you use that term with any other thing, it's too hard, it's inconvenient for me to do full gold bladder surgery, I'll do it part of it. All of the things we do to do quality medicine are hard and inconvenient. That's what we do. And it's not acceptable to say, well, our doctors can't make health care. End of story. You have to find a way because aid and dying care, again, is not about prescription care. Things change. And we owe it to our, the people we're handing lethal medications to, we owe it to keep our expertise involved. Even the very decision about are they ready to take the medications or not needs guidance. That's what we do. It's not acceptable to me when I hear people say, but it's just not convenient for science people to do that. That's bullshit. Figure it out. There I am. All right, so one question on chat is, uh, as clinicians, is it unethical to be speaking of this option to patients about this before they bring it up to us? Should the okay. clinician feel like they can bring it up to the patient or wait for the patient to ask? Um, you know, when we, teach, when, when we give options to people, I'm, I'm gonna go back to my rather sometimes silly breast cancer example, right? is I'm not gonna to talk to the patient about chemotherapy unless they ask me about it. No, we, our job is to provide options. We're not talking anybody into anything by bringing up the idea that medical aid dying exists. That's a myth. There's so much mythology out there, right? We can, in a discussion about your end of life care as you're being admitted to hospice or wherever it is, we owe our patients proof. And yes, you don't want to just sort of willy-nilly go in there and saying, well, you're having pain today. There's always eight and nine. No, we need communication skills, right? But, but the myth that we can't bring it up because we may be forcing them into that path, that's ridiculous. Who's going to say, oh, sure, I'll do that without thinking about it. It's just, and, and the, the next thing is we expect them to know the language. Who in, in our practice has ever said, I would like to avail myself of the end of life option act with medical aid and dying? What they say to us is, I'm just so tired, can you help me? That is the common expression. And what do you think they're saying say that? And yet hospices and others and everybody teaches, oh, they have to directly ask you about medical aid and dying. Well, it's, it's not our job to expect our patients to know all of the right things when they're dying and have to do it. And so my answer is, is that it's unethical to not bring up the option. When it's available, it's their legal right. Who are we to deny them chemotherapy because they didn't bother to ask for it? 
who are we to deny them medical aid and dying? Because they didn't know how to ask. That's silly, but we have to be careful. Well, that's what we learn as clinicians, right? You have a discussion and you say, here's what's happening, right? And here are all the various availabilities we would like to talk about in this. That's it. And if they say, oh, what about that medical aid and dying? And stop, please, everybody in this room, stop using the term MAID. Your patients don't know what MAID is. It's the abbreviation for medical aid and dying. It's an acronym. And I keep on hearing clinicians do that. It drives me up the wall. Um, MAIDs are people who clean their houses. They don't get it. That's insider talk. But we can't expect our patients to use perfect language every time they want something. We have to offer them the palette, the full range of what they have as an option. It is our duty. It's not only to, to say it's unethical to bring it up is to miss the point. It's unethical not. So there are two states that have waived their residency requirements. It means that anybody in the United States can avail themselves of medical aid and dying, whether they're in a medical aid and dying state or not. Yes, but let's not oversimplify. Okay. So this idea that because Vermont and Oregon have opened up their borders and no longer have a residency requirement, you have to be very, very careful to let that patient in Kansas who wants to come to Oregon and get the prescription and go back to Kansas know that they have to make the first verbal request in Oregon. They have to stay long enough to make a second verbal request. They have to get the medicines and they have to die in Oregon because it's illegal to die by taking legal medications in Kansas. And their family will be at risk. Their family will be at risk because Kansas has an anti-assisted suicide law. So, so when we talk to all of the lawyers, and, and for those of you who can get the journal, I put it up a little while ago, there's a great article by Jessica Khan, who is the physician who does the most out-of-state deaths in Oregon, who wrote a very specific article just this about, it's not as simple as it seems. In comparison, interesting. I have had, it's got to be more than a dozen and probably in the 20 range in my five years when I was actually working with patients. Patients from out of state come to California. It's so easy to establish residency in California. We didn't need an open border policy. Patients would call me from Kansas and they would say, my mom lives in California. I want to go there to die. And I would say, good, have your mom charge you a dollar in rent get me a rent receipt and you are welcome to California. You're a new citizen of California. The end of life auction act says that that's legal, right? They too though must stay in the state. They can't get the medications and take them home to Kansas. Or, or, or else, well, we don't know that. We don't know if there's a Kansas DA. We do not know if there's a Kansas DA waiting there, but just that case, is that what we wanna have, have heard? is that somebody got prosecuted in Kansas for assisting in a suicide prevention. I don't think so. I think we have to follow the law that we have. If you want to change that law, thank you, thank you, thank you. But we do follow the law that we have. Well, Jack Kevorkian is another story. Um, nonetheless, I think we have to be very careful about this. This new thing about opening up state borders, we've had open state borders in California since the beginning. It wasn't, it's not that hard to do it. What people think though, because they contact us all the time asking us about this, is that I'm gonna go call a doctor in Vermont. They'll call us up at the academy and they'll say, can you find me a doctor in Vermont who will contact me by telemedicine? Mail me a prescription, I'll get the medicines, I'll take them in here in Kansas. We get those requests all the time. We have to be very, very careful about not overstating this open borders policy stuff. It has improved things somewhat slightly. Brittany may not happen. She had the wherewithal and the loving husband, Dan Diaz, right? She had the wherewithal and the money and all that stuff that she needed to move to Oregon to make this happen. That's not what we're talking about. Of course. So we're, we're trying to open it up to others other than the very well. We're, we're a little past seven. I want to have yeah. one more question and then we're going to wrap up. So Daniel had one. We'll finish with that. Does anyone else have a question before I jump in? <laughs> no? Okay, well, Lonnie invited me This one's me been in the waiting. Me. You've been sitting there waiting. Yeah, I was challenged before this, this talk <laughs> began to ask a difficult question. So uh, I'm taking 
the opportunity to use it. I'm a philosopher, I'm not a physician, I'm not a social worker. My background is in philosophy, ethics, thinking about what's right and wrong. And I can look at things like California's law and say, oh, it's very clearly written out, but some things seem entirely more furniture. Yes. Why is this limited to people who have a prognosis of six months or less? Why do you have to have a terminal illness, right? So if you were, and I know you said you'd stay out of this, right? So that's why this becomes a difficult question. But if you were designing your own law for Lonnie and Lanny, and you got to list out requirements, what do you think would be at the top of that list? What things do you think would be arbitrary or not important? You want me to do that in 10 more seconds? Um, I'll answer that personally first. I would be very frightened if you, today, drop the less than six months. I don't think I have the skills as a clinician to distinguish between active suicide, which does exist, right? Well, we can't deny the role that there are suicides that should not happen. And people who tell me that they're severely suffering, they don't have a less than six month prognosis. I don't know where to make that. I, I, I thank the lawyers for giving me the less than six month prognosis because I don't have to think too hard. And, and if I didn't have that less than six month prognosis, I would have to puzzle through every patient and think about, hmm, is this 20 year old with severe rheumatoid arthritis appropriate for medical aid and Do I get to make that decision or are they not without clear criteria? That's that's an ethical nightmare. Thing is cringing. See, um, I want the less than six month prognosis until, until we have conference after conference of folks like you and Annette and the ethicists give us a specific tool to work with. Because right now it's too late. I don't want to help the 22 year old with severe rheumatoid arthritis die. That's what the disability community accuses us of today, right? Is that's a severely disabled person and they are frightened that that's exactly what we're going to do is help them die, set her off at the shape system. Part two of your question is what would it change? And then that answer is pretty simple. We lost a lawsuit. California. I was the lead plaintiff. And it's as follows. Um, the most significant, I'm going to phrase a question, I guess. Quite a puzzle. Um, what is the most, what is the illness that's most significantly associated with medical diet? Phrase that very quickly. Answer. Who said ALS? Clearly ALS. The reason that cancer is always talked about is the most common reason the most common patients who seek medical aid die, right? Is because there's more cancer. There's so much more cancer. That's why we see more cancer patients asking for aid and dying. But ALS is only 0.04% of the entire population of deaths annually. 0.04% of people who die annually die of ALS. 10% of our patients are ALS patients. So what is the most significant association of a disease with age and dying? It's ALS. I don't want us to diminish that reality. And the reality with ALS right now is that the law's words, let me specifically say self-administration without assistance. The Americans with Disabilities Act say, you must assist people with disabilities. Well, which law am I gonna break? Am I gonna have the ALS patient who can just get up enough strength fulfill the self-administration requirement. They can initiate the process. That's the safety the legislators wanted us to use. Well, if they initiate the process and I finish it, I just committed felony murder. And what did I do? I assisted as the ADA requires me to. Well, I'm not up to lethal injections. That would violate the self But, but we, so we went to court because clearly there's a violation of one law or the other. And when state laws violate federal laws, the federal laws, the ADA and all that, we went to court. To give you an idea, it was, it was in Orange County. Um, it was federal court. And the judge consistently said, this is a hard thing to talk about physician-assisted suicide and make decisions about it. And we pointed out, you're a judge, you work with laws. The End of Life Option Act specifically says it's not a suicide. Please don't call it a suicide. And the judge said, well, sounds like a suicide to me. 
and back and forth and back and forth, and the judge, of course, voted against us. Next choice, appeal. We lost the case, right? The, the case was that we should be allowed to assist after the self-administration starts, completely not violating any of the safety guides of the end of life, of the end of life health care. We just want to assist because people with disabilities deserve the same rights as people without disabilities. Seems pretty great. The ADA is pretty good. We lost the case. Next choice, appeal to the Ninth Circuit. Appeal to the Ninth Circuit means that they can then appeal to the Supreme Court. End of story. We're not going to the Supreme Court with any case like this. It's giving them an opportunity to reverse all of aid and dying in the entire United States. So we lost the case. And if anybody wants to change an aid and dying law, get rid of the idea that we cannot assist. Because the most significant population we deal with are people with ALS. Everybody thinks it's cancer. It's not. The penetration of, of by disease category for ALS is literally about 40 times that of cancer. And those are the patients we're not serving because we have two words in the law that says without assistance. And we tried the legal route, and that didn't work so sure. Write us another law that allows our, our ALS patients to get good care. 